everybody to Dad Poker Podcast, episode 82. It is August 26, 2020. I'm your host, Dave Schwartz, alongside Roscoe P. Coltrane. I'm very good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Terrence Chan. Hello. You got to you got to adjust that pop filter. I think uh, I think I think you're 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 popping your peas a little bit there. A popper. Yeah, pop, you're popping pee, a little. Pea popper. Uh, I will sit back. How about we get a little farther back? And Mr. Daniel Legrano in uh, in in Mexico still uh, surviving uh, several hurricanes. Is there another one bearing down on you or something? Well, actually, supposedly on Friday there will be another storm, but not a hurricane, Geneva. Uh, and I just wanted to share that, like, I don't drink alcohol except for the podcast. I have my pasta and a little bit of wine. I figure it gets me a little more fired up. But uh, yeah, I probably drank four times since May, and I think. Pretty much all of those times we ended up doing a podcast. This is what I like to do. You know, drinking alcohol pot. is bad. You shouldn't drink alcohol. The takes are hotter. It's it makes for good radio. It's awesome. Yeah. Or uh, we drive him to drink. One of those two oh things is happening. Like, oh my god, babe! I got to get through this fucking another hour and a half with these nerds. Give me more alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we just do an hour and a half of hockey? Canucks, Canucks win. Oh yeah. shit! Can't take it. Uh-huh. You see how we didn't do a sh- we didn't do a podcast after game one because the drilling that the Canucks took five nothing was embarrassing enough. We didn't want to have not that Danny would have gloated after one game in a seven game series, but it was pretty lopsided. And actually, if you know, game two was pretty lopsided as well as far as run of play. Uh, Markstrom stood on his head. Canucks blocked forty shot. I think Vegas had like ninety three shots directed towards the goal. It was it was insane. Score effects had something to do with it for sure, but um, we're going to be on opposite sides of uh, of the playoffs here for the next little bit. Our team versus your team. Uh, so far, uh, a fun series and entertaining, and and that's one thing you can say for both of these teams. They're fun to watch. No question. So, like, what's really interesting about the series now is like with Vegas, there's already this new like additional drama, which I find actually quite fascinating. Right? I'm pretty friendly with Robin Lehner, and I like Mark Andre Fleury. I like them both as goalies, and you know they're in a really odd situation you know and i've been talking to a lot of the local media guys here just about how the organization communicates because if, if you guys remember you saw that uh his agent right posted this picture of flurry in the net with a sword in his back that says DeBoer on it right going right through his back which is kind of like saying holy shit man it's like i feel like i got lied to and this has sort of been a pattern galan got fired you know un- un- unceremoniously dave Pryor, the goalie coach like they were still saying oh he's you know great with the team he's like I got fired months ago. Like, I don't know what's going on. So there's communication issues. So we have that little drama bomb, which I think um, makes this even more interesting. And I was not on the team of like, oh, Vegas is going to win four straight because of the first game. I was like, Vancouver played not good in the first. They they played not good. They did not, they did not show up in game one and Vegas just played good. Big game two. I thought Vancouver did a really good job of like blocking shots, limiting, taking advantage of some stuff. So they're going to make it a series. Now the real question is, in game three, and I posted this on uh, Twitter, like, what do you do here? Marc-Andre Fleury has not lost to Vancouver in regulation in 14 years. 14 years. Marc-Andre Fleury, okay, going into the break before COVID was 4-0. and He's played two games since he's 2-0. and So he hasn't lost. Listen, I think they're both great goalies. And, and listen, I'm not going to get in the debate about who's better, but, like, to me, it seems like the team itself will rally around Fleury if they put him in game three. That needs to happen. I don't think it will. I think DeBoer is a stubborn mule. And I don't think he's going to do that. But uh, I really think that, you know, Fleury actually might be a better matchup. For, uh, Fleury, Fleury might be better off against Vancouver than Laner simply because of his playing style. Like, Fleury will poke check, like, on that, uh, on that goal that P- Peterson scored, which is a fantastic goal. I'm not saying Fleury would have stopped it, but he would have had a better chance because he's probably going to poke his stick out there. So they're different, but I definitely think that it's really just unfortunate and sad that you take the face of the franchise and kind of treat them this way this feels wrong well one one thing i'll uh i, I mean i have to take you to ask is that the flurry hasn't lost to vancouver in 14 years obviously like that's a there's a bit of a fallacy because the team 14 years ago has z- like literally zero players in the team now but yeah i mean um i would just you know i would i would do what the stats say i mean if you're looking for the goalie you know i'm a stats driven guy i think i think you do bring up a good point i think you have to poke check Pedersen because he he dangles in front of the net so uh that that's good but you know you said you i remember you said in the first round 
that you were up. I wanted to do, I did want to do a show after we got drubbed by the Knights uh, in the first game, because you said, you said when we did the last show or two shows ago that you wish you'd bet the sweep against Chicago, they didn't end up sweeping Chicago, uh, but they were darn close. And after game one, it would not have been shocking if Vegas had swept the Canucks. I would have been curious at that point whether uh, what what your price on a, a Vegas sweep would have been? Uh, yeah, no, I wasn't. I I didn't. I didn't even think to to suggest that they'd sweep Vancouver because they have a lot of weapons. They're super talented, and they've got a really really good goalie. Uh, Chicago Crawford played really well as well. But back to the goalie thing, I just want to finish one more point in that. Like when you look at Laner, right? The best description I heard of the two different goalies is Robin Laner's. Like, if say for example, if you want a goalie that's not going to lose you the series, then Robin Laner is your guy. If you need a goalie to actually, like, steal you a series, that might be flurry. Now, against Vancouver, well, what does that suggest? That Laner's your guy. Because we are definitely a favorite. We're deeper in every facet of the game. So you, you think theoretically that. The problem, though, is Vancouver's really young, and they play laterally. And for Laner, you know, that's, that's, that's problematic. Flurry can get to a lot of these. He's a lot more flexible. He's a little quicker. I definitely think that they should consider using him. Because, listen, what has Flurry done to get benched except – like win it's all based off practice and stuff like that which i think is unfair because he he showed up late you know he wasn't he wasn't there at camp as, as early as laner and i don't know i just i also think it's really important to think about team morale this team loves flurry they love the man laner loves flurry they, they they have such a great relationship it's not robin's fault he's doing everything he's supposed to do which is work but like DeBoer needs to understand long term we want to keep the team cohesive as a unit and let's let's have these guys fired up to pitch a shout out for flurry yeah, the other thing I'd say is uh, when you think about Leonard versus Flurry, is Flurry in, in the past has has had a lot of variance in his playoff performances, right? He's been amazing, won cups. He's also shot the bed a couple of times against Philadelphia, some other teams. So he's he's had a lot of variance. And then to your point, Daniel, when you have a team like Vegas and you're playing a team like Vancouver, you don't need you don't need the variance. You need the steady guy, and that's I think that's why you look at Leonard and. And we'll see. I mean, to your point, they'll probably be pretty fired up to uh, to have Flurry in the net, but uh, who knows what will happen. Anyway, great series. It's going to be a lot of fun to sweat. Hopefully it goes the distance and we get some uh, – you know, I think Vancouver, we're just kind of hoping to get some experience out of this. we got a lot of young kids. Um, you know, I don't think we've got the back end to win a cup. I think that's uh, uh, our shortcoming for sure and maybe some of our depth. But um, if, if we get some experience here and win a series and take Vegas to uh, – to, to six or seven games and have some fun. It'll, it'll be well for us uh, going forward. Anyway, we'll get away from hockey. This is a poker podcast. We'll do as much as we can. Um, I wanted to uh, quickly – so for everybody who was on social media today, the big story in poker was uh, Timex. Mike McDonald uh, with his free throw bet that we've been talking about for a couple of years. Uh, it came out that Nick Shulman was one of the guys that bet against uh, Timex to, to make the bet. And if anybody's been following, I, I've been on Twitch. Timex has been twitching his uh, free throw attempts. Uh, with, you know, restarts, and he's got a counter that's keeping track, and uh, he's engaging with the people on Twitch. It's been a lot of fun to watch, and he got close one time. So about three or four or five days ago, he made 89. He's got to make 90 of 100. He's got about 200,000 uh, on it to do it. He made 89 of 100, and he bricked, I think, the third to last one or something. But uh, it was it was tense. He almost made it. It was fun to watch. Um, and uh, then what happens is Mike uh, sets up a session, and, you know, it, he doesn't live close to the – he lives in the Rockies, in the Canadian Rockies right now. So it takes him a while to get to the gym and get all set up and do all, and, you know, run through it. Um, so he gets set up, and uh, it's in a, you know, community gym. He shoots, I think, about 60 of his first 100, and he's doing all right, and he wants to keep going. But they, they kick him off the court. You've got to leave. You're, you're gone. See you later. We've got some more programming. And uh, – so he doesn't know what to do. He sends it on Twitter. Do you guys think this is still – because remember, the bet's for 100. He's done 60. He's got to go home, come back tomorrow, and shoot another 40. And is this continuous? Does this count if he wins it, if he, if he runs the table here and wins it? Sure enough, comes back tomorrow, runs the table, and, and hits 90 out of 100. So now there's a little bit of controversy about, you know, does this count as a win? And uh, Shulman is one of the people that uh, takes him to task on Twitter – and uh, Mike, Mike kind of goes off the deep end a little bit here. He, he we, kinda... we, is it possible, Ross, if, if you can, because it's just so fucking funny. Is it possible to play the audio uh, from Nick Shulman? Or I can just put it up here on my phone because I got it, of his video, because it was so damn funny. It was his latest tweet, this one here. Ross has got us covered. He's hooking us up right now. It's only two minutes. You've you got to hear this because it's too it's good. funny. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm here to concede the Mike McDonald free throw bet. I just can't take it anymore. Um, 
I'm feeling this heat like like I'm being scummy or something like so uh so yeah we the first bet I made for 15,000 take it Mike I mean <laughs> I guess you can just go take a night off in between the uh in between the hundred, you know, I guess that's just a normal thing. I mean, I've, uh, I've been down to the gym plenty of times. We've shot 20 free throws, 50, a hunt, you know, you just shoot him. I mean, if you make a free throw bet, you just, you, you just go shoot the number and he's getting his own boards too. So now we get to just, I don't know, you get a little dizzy walking back. I just never even considered there's a night off. And I woke up and saw what he wrote and I was just tilted. You're right. I am a sore loser. You're right. I was just fucking with him to begin with on the bet because his form looked so horrendous and I just couldn't take it. I just felt like fucking with him. And, uh, you know, um, yeah, lesson learned. We made another bet, though, for 1,000 and 20 to 1. I would like that one to stand, Mike. Uh, so, you know, take your time on that. And I don't know what this is. He has to drive three hours to get to the gym every day. I mean, okay, you know, I'm sorry about that. You're a real hero. It's a, the pandemic's going on, but there's no hoop closer to the house than three hours away. Maybe there isn't, okay. But um, <laughs> I just can't take it anymore. I, uh, he's fucking with me now. You know, just take it, Mike. I, I mean, I guess you win. We got the 60 in, and then the gym, then, then the time on the court was up. Okay, and um, we came back the next day, and I guess we, I guess we finished the hundred out. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, you know, uh, but that's it. I, I concede. Uh, you win, I lose, and um, and that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's it. So I, I say this a lot, but this this might be the worst drama of the year in poker. Oh, it's. <laughs> Yeah, but it's funny. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's harmless. Yeah, totally harmless and hilarious. I, I agree it's harmless, but it's so, it, it's, th this is so like, why, why is this such an emotional thing for both guys? For bo but, both guys. So it clearly is for, for Mike, right? Like, I think he was, it, you know, maybe he was challenged that he's not athletic or whatever. I mean, hitting eight, 90 out of 100 free throws, that's, a, that's not easy. And that yeah. took a lot Especially of Especially when you like practically never picked up a basketball before. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, I think he, it's a big personal accomplishment for Mike, right? Like we're talking about NBA numbers when you can shoot 90 out of a hundred. Yeah. He's not a 90% shooter. He needs a run of a 90. I get that, but it's still, I mean, a pretty big accomplishment. And it's, and I guess maybe, you know, Mike's not, you know, he's a younger guy and I think we'd all laugh it off if it were maybe you've, uh, you had some more life experience or whatever. I don't know what you want to call it, but uh, Mike took it personally. It clearly. Mike's in his thirties. He's not that young. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm 50, I, got, so. I got a question. I don't know if either, of you know, the answer to this, but within the bet, within the hundred. So for example, let's see, he saw, he shot the 60, went home, right. Comes back the next day. Does he get to shoot a couple practice ones, or does he just no? Have to mm -hmm. he does, that, that that was stipulated. That's a no. But I mean, but they did, they also never said that there was any break stipulation. So as long as they're 100 consecutive, I mean, I think he could theoretically just shoot one a day. Um, Good. Yeah, really I wanted to. No, that, that, was, that'd be, that was the term. terrible. Yeah. Right, but I, I think it's implied when you say consecutive. I think it, I think you strongly make an argument that when you say consecutive, it's an argument that like you keep shooting them. That doesn't include. 12 to eight hours of sleep and coming back the next day, like consecutive in that spend. I think if you asked a hundred people randomly and said, well, what do you, what does it mean to you to shoot a hundred free throws to make 90 out of a hundred consecutive? Well, that means that you would take a hundred shots and you know, but no one would think to say over an extended period of time, they would always assume that you meant or the spirit of the bet was a hundred. Yeah. I have a, Go ahead. I mean, it, it's stipulated, it, like it, it is stipulated that you can take a, as, as, as long a break as you wanted to. And I think that that comes to it. I think this whole drama show kind of, it's like unnecessary. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's like he did it. It's, I, I mean, I, I don't know. To me, it's pretty cut and dry that he won the bet based on the terms of the bet, as I understand them, like, as I've, as I've sort of read them and I understand them to be like, like he won. It's just, and, but yeah, all no, this like I, back and I forth, Terrence, make, think... making a video, like Timex making a video and Nick making a video. It's like this, like they could just, they could just type words. This is Twitter. Like, oh, it's, it's, no, come on, we need a little oh, bit. Oh, I, I guess. I mean, I, I, I want to think, I, go ahead. I just want to quickly say, so, and you know, Timex went on about, oh, it takes me three hours with round trip to get there. And it's like, 
Well, right. that's, sort of, that's sort of your problem. That's not anybody else's problem but yours. Whether, you know, because you decide to live that far away from a gym, you made a bet about doing it. Now, as to Terrence's point, in the terms, it says you can take a break. So you can take a break. However, you know, as Daniel points out, continue, what does continuous mean? And, you know, and the weird thing is Mike is also making bets that he could do it 40 times. Like if you give me a line, uh, you give me a big line, I'll do it 40 times before the end of December. Well, if that's the case, go do it once. Go do it one more time, continuous, and yeah. shut everybody up. That's, that's the part I don't get. Yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's that, I mean, I think partly, Nick, everyone's just like succumbed to the fact that, it, you know, it's over. I want to share one story because it, I can relate to Timex in one sense. There was a night we were at, uh, we were having sushi, drinking sake, Eric Lindgren, Phil Ivey, myself, and a guy named Ted Park, who you may or may not know. We're drunk, and I'm a terrible golfer, right? And we make a bet that I can shoot 100 from the back tees of TPC Summerlin, okay? Can't do that. I can't break 100 from there. But I got a full year. So let me ask you if you think this is right. So I got a full year to do it, and I get as many tries as I want to shoot 80, okay? As many tries as I want, right? Now, when you hear this bet, okay, and then you ultimately find out that I was able to shoot the 80, but I started on hole number 13. Does that change anything for you? So essentially what I was doing was – um, kind of, I guess what Timex is doing a little bit too. Like I'd start on hole number one, all right? If I double bogey the first three, four hole, I just quit and be like, all right, hole number seven is right here. We'll just restart the bet from scratch and we're starting right now. There was no cheating going on. Christian and I both decided, all right, this is hole one of the match. Is that, I mean, would, would you feel like you got sort of scammed in that button in that regard? Because there was a little like, what, so what you're saying is if you play the first five holes at 20 over, now you can start at six and start all over again? Right. So basically, look at this. I can, I, we did say this. It's like I can, I, can, I can quit a round anytime I want and restart, right? But we never stipulated what hole I need to restart on. So the, for me, the logic was, all right, I played five, six holes. I'm on hole number six. Do I want to drive all the way back to number one? Play, and, and frankly, the way the course is set up, just for the record, Number one is the best hole for me to start at because one through six are the six toughest holes for me. So it's best to start there. 13 is the worst because 13 is my, my best stretch. I ended up being two under through seven um, on 13. But, um, you know, we did say we could restart whenever we want. So I'd look at, look at where we're at through five, six holes and be like, all right, this doesn't make any sense to continue. Let's just restart. Would you guys yeah. think that's fair? I, I mean, I think that's probably um... – you know, again, again, to this point, it's probably against the spirit of the of the bet, but technically, it's it seems to be like a win for you um, because you didn't stipulate where it starts. However, a round of golf is one through eighteen, um, and if but if it's not, not stipulated, always, right? Sometimes they start on ten. Sometimes in shotguns, you start. Sure. On but to your point about continue, when you say continuous, if you ask a hundred people, where is a, you know what, where does typically a round of golf start? It'd be one. So. I mean, I get it's like the paddle. It's the it's it's the gambling thing. When you go, you make a bet with somebody. Make the rules very clear. You're not hitting a. You know, I can hit a 500 yard drive. Well, yeah, I did it at the airport. Well, I mean, so make sure that you know, all the rules are completely laid out. So there's not. That, and it seems like there was in this bet with with Mike. The, it seemed like you were allowed to take breaks. So, you know, um, Nick yeah, doesn't agree. Yeah, but well, look, Nick did. Nick said, you know, he's he obviously you feel bad about. It. Like Phil Ivey didn't like it. When I was like, well, you, what do you mean you start on 13? He's like, all right. They still paid because they understand, you know, like, well, whatever, you're right. But it doesn't feel good, you know? So you can see why someone like Nick just said, Nick's like, all right, you know what? I can see you win, but I'm not happy about it. And I, I don't know. Did, did Phil make a video about it? But it's a funny fucking video. You know, the best videos is, is I went nuts and retweet. I went on a Will Jaffe rabbit hole. This guy is now my new favorite follower. And I don't even know if he likes me. I think he called me an asshole in his videos. And I'm like, I don't know. It's fun. My wife thinks he likes me because he defends me. But he's like, you know, so what? Negrano's an asshole. Big deal. He did one video where he's like, what the fuck is wrong with you people trying to cancel Matisseau and Negrano? He's like, what do you want to be replaced by the fucking Greenwoods? He did like, a, he was, he's so funny. Like, even though he was making sort of fun of me, I, I still like him. So there's been a lot of really solid videos on Twitter. I've been not, I've been, I've been excited to read, to see a lot of stuff. And I think, uh, I haven't seen the, the Timex ones, like outside of what we've talked about here. I mean, hats off to Timex. I honestly, when this bet, I was like, he has no shot. You bet against him, didn't you? I didn't bet against him, but I would. 
if, yeah. if I was going to bet against them. I tried actually. And um, it, it's funny how many uh, people are, are, were like, Oh my God, this was a stone lock. Like I, the number of times I read today, because you know, the, the, it picks up traction of course, once he does it, the, the number of people who are absolutely convinced, Oh, this was the easiest money in the world. And yet, didn't even so much as mention in their own Twitter profile. Like these are these people with like 15 followers, right? Who are just like, oh yeah, it was so easy. I'm like, well, well, you could have bet it on poker shares and you could have even tweeted about it six months ago, but obviously yeah. you didn't think about enough of it at the time, but it's, it's so easy to just be like, oh yeah, this was easy. I had no idea. I mean, on, on, you know, you were very strongly convinced that you, that you thought he was a very big dog. And I was more on the side of don't bet against Timex. Uh, and, yeah, and, I think, and I think generally the, the, the second thing wins over the first thing. That's what Will Jaffe said. Will Jaffe does these videos and they're very funny. I think it's Will Jaffe on Twitter. And he just does these videos. They're called tough combos. He's like, time <laughs> for another tough combo. And he talks about betting like poker players thinking they can bet on everything. He's like, you know, betting against Timex. Like this guy probably when, he, when he's having sex, he's like breaking down the angles. And like, you know, the percentages of like what is going to create optimal stimulation or whatever, like you just don't bet against them in something like this. And it's clear, like the guy literally lives in a world where, you know, he loves looking at micro edges in every aspect of life. So when he says he likes that side, unless you're really, really sharp on this shit, you probably just want to go, all right, Timex. I guess you're right. I'm not betting against you. It's just a smart thing to do. You know, I, I feel like, like I, w- I wouldn't bet against you. If Mike Mattiso and Timex are debating what the right price is, right? And you don't know anything about it. It's they're talking about freaking show pony racing or whatever, like equestrian. Okay. And Timex sets a line and Mattiso sets a line. You can blindly bet on, uh, bet on uh, Timex and know you're getting the best of it by a long shot. Nice. I, th- I think he, w- I think like I wouldn't bet against him. Like if he said he could go to the moon, like I, you know, that's like, the, he's just, he's just, Spent his whole adult life like printing EV. I think. Like you have to ask, why would Timex bet this? Because he's broken down all the angles and all the math and believes that he can do it. And a bunch of other people who just say, ah, da, da, it's hard. Like they didn't put in the amount of work and thought process that Timex does. Uh, so yeah, I mean, anytime you take on a guy like that, just like Amarillo Slim used to say, if a man tells you that he can lick his own eyeball, you better believe that he's going to pull out that glass eye and stick that eyeball in his mouth. Yeah. He find yeah, he, he exploits like incorrect thinking, right? Like, so I'm a perfect example. I thought no shot and he knew that he was going to win. He already, I mean, he was, remember that he was moving the price all over the place just to get action because he knew it was a complete lock. I don't think he knew. I, I think he like felt really confident about it and wanted to be motivated to do it. I don't think he knew. I don't, I like, I, I, I think if you go back in time, I don't think he was ever like a hundred percent sure. But he might have been like 70% sure. And that's all it takes, right? Like if you're 70% sure and you're getting even, like that's, that's, that's all you need to put like a bunch of, bunch of your own money at stake, you know? He, well, knew, he didn't know 100% he could do it, like you said, Terrence, but he 100% knew he was plus EV in this bet. He was getting the best of it. And we got a, we got a tweet later where he, he's doing the same thing. He's going after uh, Dave Portnoy at uh, uh, Barstool. So we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, all right. Uh, what else we got? Anything? So yeah, we we want to talk quickly about the hurricanes. You, I saw some of the videos, Daniel, coming out of there. You uh, you had to bug out. You you took off to a hotel. It you got pretty hairy there. Well, so yeah, I, I did a vlog and I put some of the videos in there. Essentially, what happened was Hurricane Genevieve was a Category Four hurricane, which is very serious. Luckily, as it started to hit near the island or near Mexico. It, uh, it was down to a Category 3 and then ultimately Category 1. So it just hit the tip of where I'm at here in Mexico. Because uh, of it, you know, and so we were all boarded up. Like, we had workers here putting sandbags, boarding it up. But, like, when I look at where the, sand, where the beach was and is deteriorated, like, those waves were right up in my swimming pool. Like, th- that hurricane was in my pool, right? So everything was going pretty good on the Wednesday. We heard the winds. Like, we can't see anything. We can't go out there. So we're just kind of like in the dark. And my wife's a little anxious about that. Cause like if we get hit, we don't know, you know, we don't know it's just going to happen. Um, everything seemed fine. The, the power flickered a couple of times. We're like, Oh, whatever that, that's, you know, glad it came back. Then in about two in the morning, one in the morning, the power went out and uh, we, we continued to try to sleep. Um, Cause that was like the end of when the hurricane was at its worst, but the power was out. So by morning uh, we decided like, okay, well, I'm a, I want to play, you know, the tournament. And we don't know how long the power is going to be out. You know, we don't know how long. You know, they, it could be six hours. It could be a day. It could be three days. It could be a month. Who knows? So we decided to just 
pick up a few things. We went to the JW Marriott. Um, and we're not people that go out, you know, in COVID. So we were fully garbed up. And I was really impressed with, with how people here, how serious they take it. Everybody was, you know, gloved up and everything. So we spent one night in the hotel, power was back up, we came back. The house was flooded early, which was, which was strange because like it wasn't supposed to. Um, and then as the hurricane got harder, like it didn't continue to flood, but I couldn't tell where the water was coming from. It was coming from all aspects of the house. And I, you know, I had no idea where it's coming from, but uh, we're expecting another storm on Friday. And I'm told that it won't rain in here. Um, I'm supposed to play the main event, my last bullet of the GG on Friday. A little bit nervous about that because of the storm, but uh, it's coming up, so I'm gonna have to give it a shot. And uh, right. yeah, but we're safe. Yeah. Good news. I, I do want to. That's a good segue because uh, I was surprised to see that you fired twice on the day ones and were not able to advance on day three. I don't know what percentage of the field actually makes it through on day two, but was the the main tougher than you? Um, I mean, obviously, there's going to be some 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 run bad involved into not making it, but uh, you know, you've been. You've been doing pretty good in the in the at least caching portion of your World Series, but you haven't managed to. You've only got one more shot at the. You probably didn't think it was going to take all three bullets to uh, make day no, two. No, I really didn't. I mean, we do play fifteen levels, but they're thirty-minute levels, so you get tons mm -hmm. of play, you get tons of chips. Um, I ran really horrendous, and I streamed both of them. Um, speaking of streaming, I've been streaming on you. I'm back on Twitch. I got unbanned. <laughs> right? It was supposed to be a permanent ban. But I was back on there as of today. Was I was banned on my birthday, on July 26th, August 26th. They uh, they decided to reverse the ban to 30 days. So now when I'm on Twitch, I'm on my best behavior. I don't talk at all about dental proctology, about putting people's teeth anywhere but where they need to be, which is in their mouth. Um, very very, you know, I, I sit up straight, try not to say the f word too often. Well, that's not true. But anyway, um, yeah. So this is gonna be my last shot. A little frustrated. There's been some tough spots for sure. I had one guy play a hand against me and I noted it because it was really interesting. You know what? Since we're here and we're on a poker podcast, let's talk about this hand, shall we? Perfect. Let's do it. Want that? Okay. So, um, I don't know, midway through the day, I don't remember the exact stack size, but it's actually, no, it's pretty early. So I come in in the cutoff for two and a half bigs with ace 10. Okay. Make it two and a half bigs because we're deep. As when we're really deep, my race size are typically a little bit bigger. As we get later in the tournament, they revert back to mid. Small blind calls. Okay, so we have ace 10. Now the flop comes queen 10, six with two spades. Okay, small blind checks. We could obviously see bet here. We could do a lot of different things. I elect to check it back. And in the time I was talking through the hand, I said, you know, you want to have some pretty strong hands in your check back range. Okay, you don't always want to bet top pair, you know, whatever. So I check back. Now the turn card is an eight. So it's now queen 10, six, eight. So Jack nine got there, seven, nine gets there. Um, and of course, pocket eights gets there if need be. So now he bets 6.9, which is full pot. A little strange, right? So at this point, I'm feeling like, okay, well, I'm too high up in my range to fold. I can't just like check back the flop and then fold tens with an ace when there's such a, you know, a lot of draws that he could have. So I call. Now there's like 20.6 bets in the pot. He bets the pot again on a... Deuce River, blank Deuce River. He bets 20. So I'm getting two to one. What do y'all do? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, wow. I, I was actually watching. Uh, I happened to be watching when, when this went down. So I, I, I do know the results of it. I mean, I think I would have done the exact same. I, play, I think I would have played every street the same as you. Um, Wait, I don't know what happened. So don't okay, tell. you go first then. Uh, okay. So seems like the guy's trying to get value ish like he he's got you yeah you're at the top your check back range on the flop i get it maybe he's got like ace queen and didn't want to three bet daniel negranu uh, or something like that king queen suited uh or he's yeah or he's some some kind of draw he's trying to blast you off and you're you're bluff catching with that so he bets full pot in the river you've still got a lot of blinds i'm guessing like this oh yeah i have like 150 bigs and he's bet 20 bigs Feels like a fold in that spot. Why? Because it just seems like his, he's trying to get value. It's weird, right? Like playing against you and playing against somebody else is. I guess. I guess the question is this: like you, you said, I think Ace Queen is probably not a call from the small blind bear. There, you said King Queen suited, and I was like, yeah, King Queen offsuit, King Queen suited. Those are those are hands he could have this way. So if he has those, what is he targeting? I guess from Daniel. Yeah. 
So, so let me break down the hand from my perspective on the river and government. Like this is, this is definitely in the masterclass. If you haven't taken it, this is the kind of stuff we talk about. It's very, very important in terms of like how to think about making a decision on the river, right? The first things first is what are, what are, what pot odds am I being laid? Two to one. Okay. We got that nailed. Now we have to count up what value combos do we think he's betting? I now in my, when I made my initial assessment of this player, I assumed that he's going to have to have queen 10, a set of eights, a straight or better, like, or, or sorry, one of those hands to be valued. I didn't think if he had a top pair, he would go pot pot because that's not a standard line. Most people with just top pair there, they're going to bet maybe like two thirds pot, half pot, and then two thirds half pot on the river. Because as Terrence said, like, what are you targeting, right? So you want, you know, you want to get caught. So the, now, the, now the next step is, all right, how many combinations of value hands are there, right? So then you count out how many combinations, because I don't think he has pocket queens or pocket tens very often. Tens is possible. So now you're counting out, you can have queen 10, you can have pocket eights, pocket sixes, jack nine, some seven nine, right? That's his whole value range as far as I deduced it. Right? So I'm curious why you, you don't think like king queen is, is something he would value. It's not, it's not typically how people play a lot. Oh, I get that. And I, I get it that it's not typical. But again, this guy's playing against you. They do weird things, it seems like, a lot of the times when they're playing Daniel on the ground. I mean, to some degree, but then let, let's just put that part aside, like the fact that it's me for a moment, and just think about like how this person is playing their range from a theoretical perspective, right? So now I count up all the value hands that he's got, which I mentioned, right? And now we got to figure out, all right, well, what what bluff combos can he have here, right? I don't, I have ace ten, so I don't block any of his bluffs, right? Because I don't have a spade in my hand, right? I don't have a jack in my hand. I don't have a king in my hand. So he could have all the king jacks. He could have ace jack. He could have ace high spades. He could have small spades, right? So do I have enough bluff? So let's say, for example, I came out with, there's 80 combos of value, theoretically. Let's say there's 80, 80, 80 combos of value, 80 combos of bluff. Let's say that was the case. It isn't in this case, right? In that case, well, if he's balanced, 50% of the time he's got it, 50% of the time he's bluffing, I'm getting two to one, slam dunk call, right? Now here's what happens. When, he, when that equation is off, when my range assessment of what he has is off, now I can open up and make a mistake. So I'll tell you what he had. He had queen jack off suit, okay? In my estimation, he would never bet pot pot with queen jack off. When you factor in queen jack off, queen king off, and ace queen off, that's a whole bunch more combos of value that shrinks the equation, right? So now that I see that, I know, okay, well this guy will bet thin in those spots. So now I'm gonna have to make the adjustment. From a GTO perspective, He's probably not supposed to have queen jack off there too often. That might be like, if you think about the balanced range he's supposed to, to bet pot with there, it's probably with queen jack, probably like one to 2% of the time, tops. He should okay. bet queen jack on turn and queen jack on river for pot pot. Can I ask you, do you, do you think he's going to get bet 100% of his missed draws? Because you're, if you're counting all oh, his missed draws in, in that's the, the next range. stage of, no, that's a great point. That's the next stage of factoring in the equation. So let's say, for example, you have 80 value combos, 80 bluff combos, right? Well, you factor in, okay, but he's not going to bluff them all. Like maybe you won't play bet ace jack. So now maybe you, you, you factor that and you say, okay, maybe there's 60, right? So if I had 60 bluff combos and 80 value, I'm still getting a good price at two to one, right? It's because closer if he never bluffs spades, I think, uh, which a lot of people now in today's game, they don't do. They know that you shouldn't, you know, bluff your flush draws because he, like you said, you don't block his bluffs, but also you don't block a lot of his values other than pocket tens as well, because you don't block jack nine and seven, nine uh, and sixes and eights. And so I think it's, I mean, this is interesting because it's like, uh, it could be problem. It's it's almost like a pure solver problem. I don't know if you've bothered to, to to throw it in there, and and you, you know you could just say like these are all the hands that I would have opened with from the cutoff, and these are all the hands he would have defended. Yeah, that, that's line. how you do it, and that's yeah. that's the fun thing about poker, right? Is you can take this and you can actually put it into a solver and say, all right, like what should I have done with my ranger? Like yeah. from a purely theoretical perspective, like what is he supposed to have there? What am I and and, and, and am I supposed to make a call in the end? And then when you do run it, you'll see that. Um, my hand is too good to fold there, I think. But, but yeah. it's marginal at best, obviously. And now, again, you make the adjustments based on when you know you start to learn the player. Okay, does this guy not bluff enough and whatever? Now I know against that player, and I made a note of it because it was important, that he will value bet really large. He owned me. Flank, he owned me in the hand, right? Totally played it like for max value. Now, here's the thing. 
a lot of times, I guess he doesn't think I do this, but a lot of times I had ace 10 and I was checking back a strong part of my range. I'm checking back king queen there too sometimes, right? When you say sometimes, how often is sometimes? Like ace queen, king queen, what do you, how often are you checking those? So that's going to depend on the situation, but that's something that you essentially, and I won't give away my exact percentages because I do have a heads up match that's coming up in October. And I don't heard about it. I've heard something about it. But let's say theoretically, theoretically, let's say theoretically you're going to check back your top pair like 25% of the time there or in that neighborhood, right? But you don't actually even have to. It's not even that important because you are going to check back a lot of nine sevens uh, and you are going to check a lot of, you know, you're, you're going to check pocket eights as well. So uh, nine, no, but nine seven is certainly the big one because it essentially turns the second. Yeah, the nuts. question then is how often am I checking back those hands on the flop and then not raising right. the turn? Right, because the then yeah. you have a similar situation. It's like, okay, how many combos of nine, seven, and eights are there? And yeah. then you deduce, maybe you cut them in half because you say, okay, but those are going to raise. So yeah. when I don't raise, now I no longer have those anymore. So really, kind of an interesting way to think about your ranges and how to play going forward. And as I said, in the master class, you enjoyed that sort of hand breakdown. You get a lot more of that, and it's basically like an evolved way of thinking about poker. Back in the day, we used to think about poker like this: like, so this guy raised him in the flop, and I said, fuck this guy, I'm going to just go all in. It was literally just like, fuck this guy. I'm, why'd you raise? Because fuck that guy. That was literally it. Fuck that guy. Now. You didn't have it. Yeah, fuck that guy. <laughs> He's fucking around, you know? Nowadays, you think in terms of how your entire range should react, right? And then within that range, depending where you're at in it, how you would uh, proceed going forward. And I learned a lot of this stuff years ago when I was, you know, studying the new, you know, ways of thinking about hands. And it really plays a bigger role when you're deeper in tournaments. So like when you're playing 20, 30 big blinds, none of this shit really matters much. You don't need to know any of it. So most like tournament players, they're not all that advanced when it comes to solvers, unless you're talking about super high roller bowls, kind of guys who play super deep and, you know, care about the finite edges. It is the bargain of the century. Uh, masterclass.com. Uh, all right, so let's jump to some news, Roscoe. All right. What in the world is going on? I don't think it's good for the poker. Yay, poker. Hashtag good for poker. Uh, we play the news drop just to hear the news drop because there really isn't a whole lot of news other than the World Series of Poker rolls on at GG Poker. That's uh, correct. The online version. Uh, this is, uh, so we're through 72 events of the scheduled 85 events. Of course, the WSMP.com uh, events have wrapped up. So we're done with those. And we have, what, 13 left at GG Poker, including the main event, the $5,000 main event that we were just talking about. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about in a second. A bunch of people won bracelets between uh, last time we did a show and this show. Um, I didn't recognize any of the names, but if you're interested in uh, any of that, head on over to pocketfives.com. They, they write up uh, every win and they, they try and dig in, see what they can find out about the winner uh, because a lot of these guys are some, some semi-anonymous. Um, and uh, uh, Larry Bradley over there at uh, Pocket Fives, he, uh, he digs <laughs> deep. Um, and uh, the one I did want to talk did about. Did you just say Larry Bradley? Is that, that's his name, right? Larry? Larry Bradley? <laughs> that was awesome. I love how you just slipped that in there. Um, that's good. Uh, Jason Kuhn is taking the chip lead in the $10 million guaranteed uh, 25K Poker Players Championship, uh, which uh, great story. Jay Kuhn, great guy. Uh, love to see him take that one down. One point did you see his tweet this morning? Uh, it was a, he posted a fun screenshot from 2007. Uh, I won't have the exact wording, but it was an email to support of some poker site, I'm guessing stars. Uh, and he was like, I was just going to wonder what you plan to do about the $2 rebuy that was having server troubles. I was in for a number of bullets and was hoping you could refund me or something to that effect. Jay, oh, like we all, if you ever think, if you, if you ever think, ah, oh, I'm just, I'm just some, some fish with a small bankroll. Remember that Jason Kuhn in 2007 was playing $2 rebuys and really worried about his, his uh, refunds. So yeah, you better <laughs> be ready to put in the work that Jay Kuhn did yeah. uh, in, in the subsequent years though. Um, so cool story. Uh, Daniel, you play the 25 K. Um, give us a little quick uh, recap of how that went. Yeah. So my first billet on my first bullet, I ran like, um, a relatively reasonable amount of dog shit. Okay. Oh, so, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So then on my second bullet, it was, it was more along the lines of what I would call like a small horse shit. Right. And then by the third bullet, so like bullet three, I'm like, all right, let's go. Let's really do this. And it was a bunch of methane gas, a big methane gas bomb of cow shit. 
I ran like dog, horse, and cow shit in that event, threw three bullets, never had a fucking chance. I was very, very frustrated. Um, this whole week actually has been ugly. Like I've obviously cashed a shit ton. You mentioned there's like 72 events. I've cashed 30 fucking times. Not showing a profit, obviously, because you know I've had no final tables even. Um, so definitely been frustrating. But I'm not giving up yet. There's a PLO tomorrow or today, whenever you guys are seeing this. And then, of course, one more shot at the main event on Friday. And then there's there, one of the people's choice of, uh, uh, events is going to be a 25K heads up. The 10K brought a lot of buzz. A lot of cool people came into play. It's celebrity types and whatnot. So that one seemed to create a lot of buzz. I cashed in that one. So hopefully we can cash in the 25K. I believe there's still seats open. I think the cap on that one might be 128 players. And there's plenty of seats because obviously a higher buy-in, but the 10K, we sold that out and had a waiting list. And again, it was a 128 player cap. So it was popular, brought it back by popular demand. That's awesome. So I was going to ask you about that. The, I see on the schedule, three people's choice uh, events, uh, most popular pros vote and spin the wheel. I'm guessing the, the heads up, the 25K heads up is the pros vote. Do you know what the po most popular is? Do we know the other two? Um, actually, that one was the most popular one. Oh, wow. Okay. We, we based that based on like fan interaction and number of impressions and things like that. The pro vote, and I voted, I voted from a list. I actually voted for, wow, I voted for like the event that's tomorrow. So I wanted another one. I think I, did I? Yeah, I think I did. I voted for like a 1500 PM. Oh, sorry, my Siri's talking to me. Um, hi, Siri. Hi, Siri. Uh, I think I voted for, yeah. So I would obviously vote for Stud 8 or better for some freaking AB game, but we don't have that, unfortunately. So. Um, so yeah, um, that hasn't been released yet, but we do know that the most popular one is the 25k heads up, um, extension of the, I, I do think ten, heads up events do bring out the fans, right? You see these sick, I, I was a fan. I was watching like Connor Drynan and Michael Adamo. Like I was watching, I have a bet against Connor and I really intrigued by Michael Adamo's playing style. He's, he's in the last year, I would say that Michael Adamo is, hands down the most aggressive player I've played against wow. constantly in your face. Like every spot imaginable that you could go for, he's always going for it. And he puts you in a really defensive posture more so than anybody else. And listen, I don't even know if that's a good thing long-term, but uh, he knows what he's doing and he puts the pressure on. So it was really fun to watch that. And I think for poker fans, you really get a lot out of like seeing the progression of, of the match. You got guys like Dan Blazarian playing, you know, you got some celebrities. I played against the guy who I found out later. He shit all over my game. Like, I actually destroyed him. I owned him pretty hard. And later, he talked so much shit about how bad I played. And I wish you could see the hand history. <laughs> I, just, I spanked that boy good in the first round. Why can't yeah. we see the hand histories? Why can't you just throw him, grab, grab him and yeah. throw him online somewhere? Yeah, maybe. He made the common mistake that a lot of young people make, right? He saw me play one hand which was incorrect from a GTO perspective, okay? One hand early on, mind you, where I raised the button with three, four offsuit, came like queen, jack, nine, he checked, I checked, turn a seven, he checked, I checked, river like a jack, he checked, I just checked back and gave up a four high. He did this, he got up, he went, oh my God, oh, like this, like, oh my God, he checked four high, checked four high, because obviously his solver tells him that if you have four high in the spot, you're supposed to bet the river. I chose not to in the early stages, which allowed me to, and I know it's 2020, so we shouldn't say rape and pillage, but uh, I'm going to, because that's kind of what happened. Like, I, uh, yeah, I was able to, because of that hand, right, and, you know, knowing his reaction, because someone sent me the video later, um, that, uh, you know, I'd set him up so that he thought that, you know, I'm not bluffing enough. Right. And then in a tournament, when you're playing heads up, you've got to think about stuff like that. Like the early so stage. You, you could say you, you chick, chick, chick all night. Well, kind of like you're, it's like a hustle, right? So you, you, when you're playing in a heads up tournament, like the early levels are not that meaningful. If you're 250 months deep. You can make a few plays that are bad, right? If it's going to lead to that player making like incredibly big mistakes later when it matters most. And that's exactly what happened here. Yeah. Uh, some of the events coming up. You still have time. If you're out there and you want to win a bracelet, a World Series of Poker bracelet on GG Poker, there's uh, 13 events. Uh, Daniel stated uh, tomorrow, $1,500 pot limit Omaha. And then $300 double stack, no limit hold'em on the 29th. So that's affordable. $400 40 stack, no limit hold'em on the 30th. $1,000 turbo, no limit if you don't have a ton of time. Six-handed on the 30th uh, as well. Uh, then the three people's choice awards, 
uh, beat the pros, a thousand dollar buy-in, a 10 K world series of poker, super millions with a 5 million guaranteed, a uh, hundred dollar world series of poker, a uh, million guaranteed, 2 million guaranteed final day. So that's a uh, carryover for the last one. And then 85 uh, event, 85 was a $500 closer. So uh, that gives you lots of, lots of different price points uh, to get in and win yourself a bracelet. I wanted to quickly talk about the main event, Daniel. There's a, there's a 5K main event. As everybody knows, you have fired two, two of the three bullets allowed. Um, and, you know, as we look at the current numbers for the main event, because, of course, they've been running for quite some time. I think there's 22 flights. 14 have been completed uh, total entries, 2,392, prize pool, 11.3 million, current overlay, 13.6 million, players advancing, 413. So more than uh, halfway through the flights, they're not halfway to the guarantee, which would mean, I understand, you know, as it gets later, people will continue to buy in at a, a higher frequency. Uh, just, you know, you look at the World Series of Poker main event, day three always brings the most people. So, you know, let's assume that it's going to get more, but you know, is Gigi concerned at all about an overlay here? I am. <laughs> well, I was originally. Like, because listen, part of what they wanted to do, like Gigi Poker has decided to make a really big, big splash. You guys remember earlier in the year, we started January with Gigi Masters with a 250K guarantee. We didn't hit the guarantee. So what do they do? They say, let's kick up the guarantee. I'm like, okay, they really push and really stretch the envelope. So partly what you wanted to do is have the largest guarantee tournament of all time, which is 25 million. Now, 25 million, I think, reasonably attainable with that many flights. If you could like, if I could buy in 20 times or, you know, whatever, sure. I think that would surpass 25 million, no problems. But when you limit it to three, which is what we've done across the board for the World Series events for the most part, where you get like two rebuys. Um, now that limits a lot of the, you know, the field. It's probably a good thing for the event overall, but it makes hitting the guarantee that much tougher. So you're right, Adam, that like people tend to play the later heats more often than not. But uh, when you look at the numbers, you're absolutely right. Like, I think this is going to be really good value for anybody who, you know, is a decent at poker. Like, I would imagine, like, I thought this originally. I'm like, with three, only three buys, that's going to be tough to hit a 25 million guarantee. Um, so, listen, either way, whatever happens with it, the bottom line is there will be a $25 million prize pool. And either A, you have, like, a PR story in the sense that, like, huge overlay, awesome for you, or, you know, or B, like, Holy shit! Look how many people played this fucking thing, right? So either way, you know, they're they're they understood what they were getting into when they took on this mammoth thing. Wanted to have the biggest guarantee ever. We've accomplished that uh, on GG Poker with the World Series of Poker. Really create a big splash. I think a lot of people see twenty five million and are like wowed by it. I am, um, but yeah, if I had to bet on it, I would bet that uh, there will be an overlay. I, yeah. I, I come on. I like the other side. I'm, I'm not going to bet big. I'm not going to big on it, but I, I will take some even money because I think I think they'll make it. Uh, I just think that these things always tend to like you're going to get a lot of people sell in action on those right, final Terrence, flights. This is where you lay me a hundred to one. I'm not laying you hundred. Lay, lay me hundred to one on five dollars. I'll lay you a hundred to one that you win the thing. How about that? <laughs> you're such a dick. <laughs> Anyone who thought Terrence was like, God, look what he just did. A hundred oh. to one. There's eight five thousand people in the thing. I'll give you a hundred to one. Well, generous. I'll give yeah. you. You got it. <laughs> it's I'll not gonna it's, one, that's no. gotta be an even money bet that's gotta be an even what do you oh, want you want you want minus 120 um, what you, you want plus 120 what do you want what do you want? all right how much are we betting 100 bucks sure we'll do 100 right, bet. I'll, bet, I'll bet 100 bucks that they don't hit the guarantee you bet 100 that they do all right american dollars this time adam. oh dollars. Okay. i'm not setting the line i love it adam you want any of that ross you sure want any sure I'll, I'll lay uh i'll give you the plus 120 we'll go that way how about that oh look at this the adam's adam's even plus giving you money just sure. look at this. actually you know what i'm He's gonna just handing out ev i'm gonna give you plus 300 you're gonna give me three to one what yeah Over. Yeah, this is just a little. I mean, I'm tossing it back a little bit here. I'm, oh, you're getting. I'm not a rich getting, guy. You're getting not a rich back. guy. But I'm tossing it back a little bit here to Negroni, ah, giving us the hundred to one. Hey, Ross, you want to let go of some of those winnings? <laughs> you got a price for me? You want to bet a little bit? Small, fifty bucks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's do uh, fifty bucks at uh, at two to one. You know, okay. Oh, two to one. So all you guys have a lot of faith that GG Poker is going to get the twenty fifth million guarantee. You have a lot of faith in the. Uh, poker bankrolls of the uh, poker community. So I hope, I listen, this is a bet I really want to lose because I'd love to see more, you know, I'd love to see them hit the guarantee. Um, I forgot which side Perfect. I was betting. This. You, you bet. So I, I don't want the, 
Ross, Ross, you might be you. you I, I might have to buy you into this thing to to uh, just, just just to spite Daniel. <laughs> All right, I'm betting Canadian. Daniel dollars. said he can promote me. I can uh, I can I can sell pieces. That's it. Uh, all right. Uh, before we head on to tweets, just want to quickly again thanks uh, to Larry over at Pocket Fives. He put together those numbers. Larry Larry Bird? No, Larry Bradley. He's he's each week he's putting together all the numbers Larry from Bradley. Larry Bradley, yeah. Pocket Fives. <laughs> That's he's his name, putting, right? Larry. Yeah, he's putting together the numbers each Why week. Why does his name Larry know it now? His name's Larry. That's that's his name. We're calling him Larry. That's his name. Yeah, I'm just trolling him. Uh, all right. Uh, let's get to some tweets. <laughs> Larry Bradley. Thanks, Larry. You're going surfing on the internet. Terrence, you are first up. Uh, let's clear about 15 minutes off here for this one. <sighs> Holy crap. Okay. Any, anybody Tom watching on YouTube, up. you can you can skip the next 15 okay. minutes if you don't want to hear an old man g- going off on stallers. Please but I just tweet. take like three breaths before you do it. There we go. Okay. Uh, at T Chen Poker. That's me. If you're stalling at 102 players left with 47 paid, I wish for gruesome and horrible things to happen to you. Now, I, I walked that back a little bit. I said, like, listen, I, I, I don't really, you know, I don't want to be like a Daniel Teeth in the, hyperbole. It's te- hyperbole. Teeth in the rectum thing again. So, I mean, it's a little hyperbole. I took it, walked it back and I said, you should only be punched in the kidneys and not even probably that hard. You should be punched in the kidneys for every hand that you stall. Um, and that's that's where I'm I'm committing to. I think you should get like a gentle punch to the kidneys. It's not like a full like wind up like Mike Tyson style, but you should get a little shot in the kidneys if you're stalling. I mean, I'll tell you what, I played with a guy. I played with a guy who's a professional poker player and he's trying, he says, I, my kid's got to eat. And we're talking on snap cam because you can do that on GG. Uh, you can just, you know, shoot. and he's like, listen, Nagrana, before you, before you, you know, you yell at me for stalling, just know I'm just trying to feed my kids or whatever. But he does it from hand number one. Okay. <sighs> Oh from, my! From the very first hand of the tournament, he takes the max amount of time. Now his theory is, based on ICM and tournaments, that like by doing that, he thinks he gets like a bigger edge because he's more likely to cash, right? And I tried to have the conversation with him civilly about how if you're a plus EV player and you think you're a winning player, you're playing way less hands, which is going to cost you a lot of chips by the time the bubble gets there because you're not going to be able to accumulate as much. And, you know, he's like, oh, I'm not so sure that's, you know, that's fixed or whatever. You also are kind of being a dick, right? Because, like, if everyone did exactly what you do, what is that called? Solomon's, Ackman, something? The prisoner's it's dilemma? The prisoner's dilemma, yeah. Prisoner's yeah. Dilemma. yeah. So if, like, everyone does exactly what you're doing, you will completely destroy the thing. So maybe don't do it, right? I get their point of view sometimes. They're like, well, if it's a problem, then change the rules. It's difficult. It's kind of difficult. I believe we should you know, we're eventually going to have to get that place when more needy people try to do this, get to the point where we just go full chess clock and you run out, you run out. Sorry, your hand's dead. Yeah. You know, I got into this with, uh, with, I, I've been preaching about this. I, I, I went and I searched my own tweets. I've been bitching about this since 2011. So people are tired of me hearing it, but I got into it with, with Ike Haxton and Justin Bonomo three years ago, two guys who have made a lot more money at poker than me and two guys who don't have kids to feed, um, you know, cause they're, I think they're, I think they're probably both doing okay. Extremely nitty. Like they're super nitty. Like, I mean, like if, you know, like they're those kind of people, like the bill is a dollar 47. They're not going to like leave the 53 cents. They're going to take that because they'll, you know, morally they'll do better with the money somewhere else or some shit. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I I mean, (laughs) you probably know better than me, but my interactions with them, like in person have been, have been fine. I don't, I don't think they're, I think they're bad people. They're just super nitty. Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I can't, I can't speak to that, but I mean, I actually got into that at the table. This wasn't even online. I got into it with him on Twitter and I, then I got into him at the actual world series at the Rio and, you know, they said, okay, yeah, you've got to change the rules. Um, and you know, the same, similar kind of things as, as what the person that you were playing with was saying, but we're talking about half the people cashing in this thing. And, and you're talking about guys doing it from hand one. Like if you scale that up, like imagine playing the world series main event, like what, 1500 people or 1300 people cash in the main event imagine if they started stalling at like 2500 it would make the experience I'm miserable this guy- i'm gonna play the devil's advocate and this is mm-hmm. what i hear is all right how can you how can you terrence tell people to do things that they believe are against their financial interests right yeah. i'm playing if i'm playing for money like i like the guy says like i got kids to feed and i think stalling from hand number one is best for me and the rules allow me to do it what, what leg do we have to stand on here, Terrence? I mean, I agree. We, but we do a lot of things in our life that, 
you know, could earn us a little extra money and a little extra EV by, by behaving like shitheads. Like, you know, you go to a restaurant where you're never going to go back there again. You can stiff the waiter. Like there's no law against it. Like, you know, you, you know, there's nothing is going to happen to you if you stiff the waiter. You know, I, I live out in the woods. I could burn my garbage every day. The only person like, I mean, I, and then that way I don't have to, to pay the garbage bill, like to come pick up my garbage, but I'm destroying the environment. Like we live in a fucking society here. You know, we, we, treat each other with some decency. Like we could, we could, you know, we talked about these people who, who went to Costco and bought up all the toilet paper to sell it at markup at the beginning of COVID. Like there's a lot of shitty things that you can do to, and a lot of things that make the rest of society miserable for you to make an extra buck. We try not to do it because we function in a, like, you know, we, we have, like, we all enjoy to some extent, at least playing poker. Right. And it makes the experience so unenjoyable. I was sitting here with 102 players left in this thing with fucking an average stack of seven and a half bets in limit hold'em. An average stack of seven bets. Like that's barely enough to play a hand. And I'm just like, I'm just watching YouTube videos. I'm, I'm reading a novel on this side. I'm chatting with my friends. I'm paying no attention. Like I came to play a poker tournament. I want to have fun play. Like poker's not my job anymore. Like I did this for a long time. I don't have to do it. If I'm playing poker, you know, it's a, it's a, I'm trying to make a profit, but I'm mostly doing it for fun. And th- it's not fun to do it. It's unpleasant. I stopped doing these things. We got to start not being shitty. And I want, you know, we can't do this. It's, it's hard to do it. You know, you talked about the solutions like online, we can do the chess clock thing. We can do a little bit more about that. We can even go to the steps of, of banning players. You know, we had this conversation about banning people that are bad for the ecosystem, people who shoot angles, people who button, people who bum hunt. I think that's in this category. If you're yeah. under the gun with yeah. six deuce offsuit, Right, and you've got like nine big blinds in a no limit holding tournament, and you're taking thirty seconds to fold your six deuce offsuit. That's being bad for the game. That's yeah, just. Parents, I'm so glad you brought that up because I actually was going to go right there with it and say, so what do you think about theoretically a site saying to somebody who's tanking habitually, send them an email and give them a warning and say, we've noticed that you're tanking too often and you're taking too much time. If you don't speed up your play you won't be welcome to play here anymore, right? Yep. Now, for me, that's a deterrent. That's a legitimate deterrent where these people now have financial incentive to go, well, I better speed up my play because I want to play here, right? And I want to have a good experience because you're absolutely right. I was playing in a table too at a six max where it was like 20 minutes before the rebuy period and I was trying to gamble, you know? But this guy was like tanking the full amount every time. So like it was making me stressed out because I'm like, I can't gamble. And I thought to myself, <laughs> if I could, I'd get rid of him. Like I wouldn't even let this guy play. So. I, I'm 100% in your camp, and what I will say this, it's what I'm so happy about being with GG, and they're like, they'll think outside the box to do whatever it takes to make the experience enjoyable. As you said, you don't play professionally anymore, but how tilting is it is when you're like, there's 105 players left and 40 get paid, and they're just, everyone's taking the full amount of time. So how do you deal with that? There are ways in which the, we can adjust the rules. There's problems with that online, though, right? If we do chess clock, what about people who disconnect? You know, what, there's, there, but I do have some ideas on how to fix that. Having said that, if we know somebody is habitually playing against the spirit of the rules, which is like you said, to have seven deuce off suit under the gun and take the full amount of time every, every time, we give them one warning and say, listen, if you don't speed up your play, you won't be able to play. You, actually, how about this? We can go a step further. If you don't speed up your play, you'll no longer get a clock. You won't get a time bank anymore. You, how about this? Forget about it. You can play. You can play, but you no longer, you specifically, because you take the full amount of time and drain it every single time on hand number one, you don't get a time back anymore. You can play, no problem, no time back. Or you can adhere to the, you know, to the spirit of the game. I think we got to be more aggressive with these kind of things because when you have money on the line, people are going to always look to push the envelope and try to squeeze out every angle they can. And when people like that do that, it hurts the ecosystem. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I'd love to see Gigi do that. I think you got to be careful with, uh, you know, I had bad connection that day. But so. you don't, you don't do it to the people with bad connections, right? No, like I if don't. a guy, if a guy just like, he's, you know, he has one single hand where he takes like five minutes with eight, five offsuit. You don't just go like, Oh, that guy's a staller sure. because it, you, you look at all the other hands where he had trash and he folded quickly and you know, this guy's not stalling. So, I mean, I don't, you, you know, if you're taking clocks away, you take it away from people who deserve, you know, you can see, you go, oh, I mean, yeah. I've worked start, on the other side of, if you would have let me finish, I was going to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely yeah. what I was going to say. If, yeah. you, if you can pinpoint somebody who sits there and folds all the time, takes the full time and folds and, and give them five seconds. Now their, their account is limited to five seconds. Great idea. 
I hope that happens. And I'm sure, Daniel, you're probably going to be. Listen, you can start with the most egregious, right? So you start with these most, the most egregious, and then you let, and then everyone else starts to see this is happening. You're like, holy shit, you know, this is a thing, right? So I, I don't want to be on that list of most egregious, so I better speed up too. And if you start there, you slowly work your way back down to some sort of normalcy. But as Terrence said, like, obviously, sometimes people need a little more time to think, and that's fine. The, what about the, the, the GG final table time bank system? That's that, great that seems to work well. But again, the only issue with that, and I think it's a great system, I love what GG does, which is essentially well, the way GG works is a lot of the final tables, if you played quickly up leading up to the final table, you didn't install, you'll have more time at the final table, and it goes by time, not number of hands. Oh, sorry, it goes by number of hands. There's no, it's not like 15 minute levels. It's like this level is 30 hands, you get a 12 minute clock to play the entire final table, and you use it as you wish, and it starts after a couple seconds. So that's a great, great fix. The, un, the other issue is Terrence brought up and so did Adam as well. He's like, well, what happens when somebody disconnects? So they just out? That's not fair, right? So a lot of things to consider, but I do think it's like in everyone's best interest to find creative ways where we can curb this behavior. Because listen, you have to have some empathy and you have to acknowledge the fact that if you're a grinder, you know, and this money means something to you and it is in your financial interest to take the entire amount of time, who are you to tell me who are you telling me to speed up because it's like good for I get the-, the stalling at like three tables left. I mean, I, I get that, right? Like when you're, when you're like three tables from the money and it's not quite hand, I think sites should probably go hand for hand earlier and that would help a lot, but we don't want to go hand for hand. Like, you yeah, know, but like when there's- me, That's your personal level of morality in terms of when it's okay to stall, right? right. Other people's is way earlier. Right. But like to the guy who said, who's stolen from hand one, because I see him and why that he, he maybe is technically like, why are we even playing the tournament? Right? Like, why did we even show up to play? We showed up to play to make better decisions than other people. Okay. And like, if you're a pro, like you said, like more hands benefits you because you're, you're making these decisions better than other people. And if you're a recreational player, you're a weak player, like then you are at least there to play poker. I would assume so. I mean, you know, if you're, this you know, guy if you doesn't believe that. He yeah. believes stalling from hand one increases his EV. So if he genuinely believes that from hand one, but how can it be? How can how can it be correct to pay rake and show up for a tournament and play no hands? Like you can, where where does the skill edge come? Well, right? listen, that, the bottom line is like we could obviously have the argument with him, but he believes this. He believes that by playing right. less hands, he gets closer to the bubble more often. He cashes a higher percentage of the time, which in the long run will help him. All right. So if he believes that, that's his strategy. That's his style. You know. We don't tell people how to play the game, like in terms of right. like what bet sizing they should have. Well, it's- that's why people late register too. That's why people max rate register, which is like an EV maximizing thing to like do the Chris Ferguson thing and try to register as late as humanly possible. That's that's why you do that. But there's an easy way to combat that, which is just push the late registration, like don't cl- push it close to the money. So yeah, if, if he believes that, then that's a problem. But I mean, it's, I mean, it's, I don't get it. Like, why did you come to this tournament? Like, why are you well, here? You, you're either here to make money or you're here because it's fun. Parents- He, listen, Terrence, he's there to make money, okay? And he thinks this gives him the best chance to make money. You disagree, I disagree, but that's what he believes. So where do we stand in terms of like, first of all, the rules allow it. He thinks it's giving him the best chance to win. Like, what do we do? Yeah, what do we do? All right, so we put out the tweet today for topics uh, for the podcast. Let's rifle through them. We do have a bunch of voicemails as well. So let's get through these. Uh, Hussein Sajwani writes, uh, what has Canada done over the years to become less racist and more diverse uh, over the years uh, compared to America with this? That's a four hour show. So I don't know if we well, can. Do you think that. that's true though? Like, so I do think like Canada is split up really interestingly, right? Like in the, in the big cities like Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal, right? It's a melting pot. Like Toronto is the most multicultural city in the entire world. However, if you go out to like Saskatchewan or Calgary or whatever, where it's predominantly homogenous with like white, you do have still like a reasonable amount of racism. I, I think it's as simply as, it's as simple as uh, integration, right? In areas or cities where you have, like when you watch the news in Toronto, like it was really shocking me every time I go back. Like I see someone, I see like a woman on the street doing news in a hijab, right? Then I see another guy named, you know, Giorgio Takanopoulos doing the sports with a Greek accent. And then like, there's no, there's no guy named, hello, my name is John Smith and I'm bringing you the news along with Buck Johnson. You know, it's like, my name is Tikani Skala, whatever. It's like a total melting pot. So in those areas of Canada, I think people have, you know, just sort of been accustomed to like knowing other people of different things. So like, how do you hate when you have friends like that? But in small town rural areas where like Don Cherry's from, 
or wherever, or where he, he's like, people are a big fan of his. I do think there's like a lot of racist pockets in Canada. I don't know if you guys, you guys still live there. You can tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, there's uh, definitely a lot of, a lot of, I would say a lot of uh, racism directed towards indigenous people. And especially in those areas, Saskatchewan. I, I think Manitoba. it's, yeah, I think it's, I think you're right. I think it's a less militant sort of racism. I, I think the racism in Canada tends to be sort of like, in homes and behind closed doors and all of a sudden you don't, you don't kind of have the, like the skinheads going out and marching on the street with their guns and like that kind of, it's like, there's less of a show of it. Um, I don't think, I think you're, you're, you're kind of on the right track, Daniel, which is that I think in the heart of hearts, like there is as much, there is close to as much racism in Canada as there is in the U S but we don't have the, the politicalization. We don't have like the militancy and, and, you know, it's just, people are not quite as aggressive about it, but, but, but I think you're right. I think the most diverse U S places are similarly racist or not racist to the mo- more diverse places of Canada and vice versa. I I think really, really it's, I'll just quickly, I want to say that it's institutional in the U S rather than in Canada. I think that's the difference, but anyway, I think this, though, to speak to the point I said about like knowing the person, I read a really great article about, about a guy who was like, he's like, uh, he was in the middle a guy who was raised in middle America and, you know, was a bi-coastal or whatever. I can't remember the name of the title. But basically, make a long story short, this is a guy who grew up in middle America, went to college on one of the coasts, right? During college, one of his roommates is a guy named Dave who was gay, okay? So he, made, he, he wrote the whole piece talking about how, you know, in middle America, you know, wherever they were, wherever he was specifically, they talked about gay rights. I'm like, well, hell no. They shouldn't have the right to be married or whatever, right? That's not right. But then he's like, but then he's like, well, but not Dave, because Dave's a really nice guy. Yeah. Like, Dave should have a right to get married, because I like Dave. Dave was my roommate. He's really nice. Because once he knows Dave, and once he has the opportunity to have, like, you know, soccer parents that are lesbians or black or Indian or whatever, you start to personalize it rather than characterize. And I think we live in a world now of social media where even me, okay, to a, to a lot of degrees, like, I'm not real famous, but in poker, I'm obviously famous. Kate Hall came to me and said this, and it really meant a lot to me. She apologized to me because she'd realized that she sort of characterized me based on tweets and all those kind of things is like not a human being and not a real person. And I, you know, I, cause I called her and I told her, you know, we had a good conversation because we had some disagreements about stuff, but it's so easy for her to paint me in this way. Cause she didn't know me, you know, she never had a chance to hang out with me or talk or so she saw me at the world series at a poker table, talking to different people and engaging, having fun. And she came over to me and it's like, I just want to apologize to you. And then she gave me a big hug. She's like, I see how you are with people and I see that you, you mean well and, you know, you're fun loving and all this kind of stuff. And I just characterized you based on like these, you know, few tweets and stuff. And I think social media does more of a disservice in all of these ways than we know. Right. Because how often do you see someone on Twitter and you're like, I hate this fucking guy. You know, if you saw this guy in person, you might actually have beers with them and be cool with them. And they're like, you might disagree and go, whoa, whoa, I disagree with that. But in person, we're so much more friendly and cordial than we are on messaging. Right. Like I, I just was talking to Mike Mattis today. Because we talk, we still talk, right? We're, we're still chatting about how I told him, I believe that you're a guy with a good heart who's totally misguided and we disagree on everything. He said the same about me. Now, if we're in person, you know, we can have a, a civil discussion, but on social media, it's rarely civil, man. And I like, I've done a good job of getting out of that world because it's just toxic, but it contributes to the division, the racism, the, the left, right, all the bullshit. And I know you get involved too, Adam, and we all do a little bit. But overall, I mean, fucking the end of the day, man, like if we could just sit with people and have drinks and have beers, we get so much more done than if we just sit on our phones and go, da, 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 da. you said this, but here's proof of this. And what about this? And what about that? And all Bill Clinton got this and then the pizza parlor and then fucking 5G and your brain and mind control. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. <laughs> All right. Uh, Josh O'Neill writes, uh, could a casino make a progressive bounty work for a live tournament? Interesting. Guys? Yeah. Why not? Right? Yeah. Yes, it, not? There'd be a lot more tracking involved because you wouldn't want people to like rat hole their, their bounty chips, but I'm sure it could be done. There's gotta we, be we, we live in a computer age. There might be a logistical way where you like just only you, you have to hand in your previous right. bounty chip and then you get a new one. Yeah. Like, you always have to have a bounty chip. So let's say the dealer has in his tray 200, 400, 800, 1600 or whatever, right? So, you know, you bust somebody, you have to give him your 400 and then the dealer gives you the 800. And then that you would work. It. And that's the only one you have. Hey, look at that, I figured it out. <laughs> and people thought I was stupid. Come on, bro. We did it at Matt Savage. Get Matt Savage thinking about it. That would be the way to go. 
Uh, don't talk to him about hockey, though. Just talk to him about poker. You don't want to talk. Well, to him. Who's he a fan of anyway? Not it's hard to know. Who's 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 winning tonight? I don't know. I haven't checked the scores tonight. Who's winning Whoever, tonight? Whoever's I, winning. Dallas is winning. So oh, Dallas. oh, oh. Got touch Matt Savage, game. Dallas Stars fan, hard day one. You gotta throw this for record. Vegas won the first game. I thought Vegas played well. I didn't think Vegas played well. I still thought it was going to be a series. I, you know, Matt, of course. Let's start. He's like, sorry, y'all. I thought it was going to be a series. <laughs> You know, and then he's got to eat his words in game two. I knew, I knew better. I didn't go there. He never learns. He never learns. He does it every time. All right, uh, Tommy Giuliano, uh, since y'all are hockey fans, would love to hear if you think the NHL should follow uh, the MLB and NBA and boycott the games. Uh, well, I mean, should they? That's not – I mean, that's up to them to decide. I, I, think, I think for me, and I saw this today, where the NBA um, decided to um, forego all their games and baseball followed suit. Yeah, hockey did but, players, but players themselves in the NBA, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think they're. Uh, I you know, obviously, I'm I'm, I'm way, right behind the, all the different protests and things that that need to happen to bring change. Um, but I think as far as for sitting out the basketball games past like one, holy shit! Like I get today, they're just like, oh my god, like I can't process this. I can't focus on playing. Today's a really bad day to play, you know. But going forward, there's talk about you know ending the season and and things like that. I think there's got to be a goal sort of that they're working towards here and a reason for doing all that. And, and I mean, I, and I think the goal is raising awareness, right? Like we're yeah. sitting here on a poker podcast talking about the NBA potentially. And demands. They have specific yeah. demands like the Milwaukee Bucks United came out and they read a, they read a statement. I, re, I listened to it today. And essentially what they want is they want, so they basically, they're basically saying we won't play unless we can get a hold of, you know, government officials or whatever to do something about what happened recently and what's been happening over months. Cause like, I, you know, it's a tough spot. Like, will it make a difference? I don't know. It's not for me to say. Um, but like everything they've tried so far, it seems to not have, you know, made a huge impact. So listen, I have all the respect in the world for people to do what they believe is right. That isn't necessarily in their best interest, like in the, in the moment. Right. Cause like a lot of people are going to hate them for this or this, or blah, blah, blah. Like, they don't get to play and all that stuff. But people taking a stand for what they believe in doesn't matter where you are politically. You should respect that. You should, you know, that's part of what, you know, the American Constitution allows for in the First Amendment. And these guys are saying, listen, we want, not only we're going to talk the talk, because a lot of them said Fred Van Fleet of the Raptors, whatever, is like, you know, we keep saying this stuff, Black Lives Matter, all this kind of, but like, what's changing? Like, what's happening, right? We've got to take bigger action. And if the biggest and most notable athletes and you know different people like that all unite like this maybe maybe i don't know maybe this makes a difference where it expedites change in terms of reform i hate the term defund the police because it just sets off sets people off but the idea of reforming the protocol for what it takes to be a cop like it you need more man hours to be a hairdresser than a cop that's a problem right off the bat there needs to be more psychological testing more training about how to deal with like high intense situations more screening it's a shitty job, right? Not a lot of people want to do the cops. So you got to have a lot of respect for people that, you know, choose to do this for a living. But at the same time, we have to think about society as a whole and who are we giving this badge to and why do they want it? And what are they going to do with it? All right. I was bringing it back to hockey. I think, I think, uh, them, uh, I think the Minnesota wild got karmic payment for not starting Matt Dumba in any game by being eliminated by the Canucks in the plan. Yeah, it was sad that more people did get behind Matt's statement. I, uh, I, I thought back to – His team didn't even really seem to, which was yeah. probably the most disappointing thing. Totally, and, and I thought back to Colin Kaepernick, right? Because Colin's the one who started it with the kneel, and it slowly sort of has gone from there. And he faced – he got blackballed from the league. Now, was he a good quarterback? Could he play it? Who knows? I get that. But – Yeah, but that's bullshit because everyone knows that, like, with 62 quarterbacks, he, there was, he sure. was better than a lot of them. For sure. I'm just saying it's unknown. That part's unknown. He could have played in the NFL, no question. Um, um, but he didn't, and there's a reason why he didn't. It's because he knelt, and nobody wanted to take on that liability, you know, f- to their fan base or whatever. And it was sad because I thought about that when Matt Dumbo was doing it in hockey, and and it, it, it looked a lot like the early days of Colin Kaepernick. I um, think that I think that, you know, I was talking about this earlier, and in terms of the demographics of the fans of each league, it's – Unfortunately, I feel like with the NBA, this is going to have the least effect of, of any of the leagues that were, you know, if, if any of those teams were going to protest. Like, think about the reaction if the Packers took, you know, protested their first game. That would, I feel like that would have a bigger... I mean, there's been steps. NASCAR banned the Confederate flag. 
So yeah. but that might happen because so that you're right. I get, I get what you're saying, Russ, but that might happen. NBA guys do it. It may inspire others to do it. I don't see it happen in the NHL because they're still all old boys network. You know what I mean? That's like John Tortorella until recently was like, anybody kneels, they're not going to play, blah, 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 you know, all that kind of stuff. So the point is, is like, it's an idea now where if it starts to affect people on a grander scale where they're like, no, we're not just, it's not just Colin Kaepernick on his knees now. It's every freaking athlete in the entire country who raises people's spirits through sport and everything like that saying, we want to see significant progress and change, not just lip service. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Lewis, uh, for everyone, which form of poker is your most profitable? Which form of poker is your most fun to play? Just curious if they're the same. Um, mine now is I'll start quickly. PLO, PLO. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think we've talked about this on previous shows. I have a thing where I have a hard time having fun when I'm, when I'm not good. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a mental block for me. And it's something that's hard. And it's something I've tried to deal with, with martial arts, which is something I was very bad at, at the beginning, but eventually got good at. Um, but it was still fun while I was doing it with poker. I never, I never really had that. Like, I, I hate the feeling of, Oh my God, this guy's betting into me. I don't know what to do. I should have studied the spot. Like, I don't know. Like I played this hand so bad on every street. Like the, it makes me feel so gross when it's like that, like, and that's, that it's a block for me. It's really hard. We talked about this on last week's show, whether I'm, you know, as a plus EV in some of these world series, no limit events, because I don't really study no limit that much. And I don't really play full time because I've got a kid and all this blah, 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 blah. So I do tend to have more fun in my more profitable games. And I think it's, and, and I, and I think it's a, it's a block for me. I enjoy playing like all, all the games, like all the, all the mix of games. I love playing. I love playing like, you know, I would play like a 20 game mix for fun, but I hate the feeling of sucking, you know? So I don't play the, I, I don't play the, the, the 10 game mix because there's like four games in the mix that I don't really feel good at. Well, just walk like uh, the other guys do. Yeah. I, I meant, I meant like a, like the world series 10 game mix, but yeah. Um, but yeah, like something like horse, right? Like it's, it's like, Oh, I prefer eight game over horse because there's a few more games in eight game that I'm better at than horse. Like horse, I'm not, you know, it's, so yeah but to more directly answer the question it's something that i'll have to work on to get over i think i've had a lot of fun i mentioned this before i've had a lot of fun playing short deck and learning it it's very gambly you get to play a lot of hands you get to see a bunch of flops uh when you get it in bad it's it's never really that bad so you don't feel too bad about it i think that's why i like it as sort of my my learning game and my experimental game because uh, you know you get it in bad. It's not really that bad. It's like 40, 60. Uh, PLO is a little bit like this as well, but you can, you can be put in some, some rough spots in PLO. Uh, and obviously I've, I've made many, many dollars at uh, limit hold them over the years. I'm an, I'm an old dinosaur. I specialized in limit hold them for a very long time. I got to the highest stakes. I made a lot of money at it, but, uh, other than, other than two tournaments, I didn't, I didn't, I have, I've played like no, I, I played this, the scoop limit hold them and I played the, the GG world series limit hold them. And that's, that's like most of the online poker I've played this year because I, I play an old game that nobody plays anymore. Daniel? So for me, you know, I'm going to, you know, answer this theoretically because I actually don't really play one of these formats, but the most profitable thing for me to play right now would be no limit hold them cash games, especially private games and stuff like that with straddles and all kinds of celebrities and different things like that. That would definitely be the most profitable and I could probably make the most money doing what's most fun for me to play would be like the eight game or 10 game or 11 game mix with the Bobby's room guys. And we're playing that online and I do play that occasionally. I haven't been playing it lately because I've been focused on the tournaments, but the edge there is not going to be very good. There's a couple games that I'm not that good at. Like, you know, Terrence mentioned doesn't like to play games. He's not like deuce to seven Raz. I've never really, I don't have a lot of reps in that and Badoogie straight don't have a ton of reps, but uh, I definitely enjoy playing mixed games. Um, but in the fields that I play in, they're not as lucrative at all as like Nolan cash games would be. Uh, Sam Warger writes, I expect at least 45 minutes of Canucks versus Vegas talk. We covered that. How about 10 minutes from Jason Rankin? How about 10 minutes on uh, why Ryan Reeves is the Conn Smythe front, r- front runner? He's kidding, obviously. Uh, Peter writes, uh, will the World Series of Poker have a live main event in November? Uh, that seems like the answer is no. I mean, I've been hearing rumors about, you know, things. Uh, I've been, I've been hearing rumors about a world series in November. I don't know if Daniel, if, if you have as well, but I, I would not, I would not lay a hundred to one on that one. Oh, I would tell you pretty strongly not to bet on a world series in November. I don't think that's happening. I would say it's, well, 
listen, I, I mean, I don't want to do these bets because I always fucking get screwed when I lay 101, but I would lay 101 that, in theory, I'm not actually really going to lay it. But You're I not lay. offering this? This is an theory, offer. I would lay 101 there's no World Series in November. Wow. Okay. Oh, wait. Having said that, no, no, like not in the U.S. World yeah. Series Europe, I'd say World Series Europe, I would not lay it. I think that could happen, but I don't see a World Series of Poker at the Rio in uh, – right. I World mean, the stuff that I heard was that problem. there would be like sort of some stuff, some higher buy-in stuff, um, you know, like sort of in like the 2K to 10K range, like none of the, none of the Colossus stuff, the bunch of, bunch of eight-handed stuff. This is, this is rumors that I, I heard from a couple of industry people, but I mean, it, it could be all, it could be all nonsense and your information is probably better than mine. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, it was like if we're, you know, we're not, nobody, nobody's laying a hundred to one, but I, I mean, I feel like. I, w- I would I would certainly take 100 to one. I mean, I feel like I would kind of even take 20 to one. Um, but yeah, um, there's there's a series coming up at the Venetian. I do know that. Um, is, there's an eight-handed tournament uh, series coming in the Venetian. And um, yeah, so right. I mean, and people, tournaments in Europe, uh, as Daniel mentioned, uh, I think Rosvedov's been actually having some really large fields. Uh, I think Rosvedov had like a 900-player tournament not not very long ago. All right, let's skip to the uh, voicemails. Roscoe, how many you got? Uh, as many as you want. All right. Uh, all right, let's start off with one and see where we go from there. Okay. Email number one. Hey, fellas, this is Dave from Cleveland, Ohio. Love you guys. Love the show. Everybody contributes so well. I think Ross is my favorite. Uh, I did want to ask all four of you, though. This is more than just you know, on a cold streak or, or a rough patch, how do you guys handle when maybe you get a little bored of poker or you consider, yeah, maybe I don't want to do this much anymore. And it's not about losing, but more just losing that fire sometimes. Does that ever happen to you? How did you get past it? What do you guys do to kind of rekindle that love of the game? Because I know you guys, you sound like you all love it still. How does that work? So thanks. Keep up the great work. Great to talk to you. Take care. I, I love it. I first want to comment that this was, it's some sort of coincidence. That was the first voicemail that Ross picked. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it actually came in a couple of weeks ago. I, I... Uh, guys, how do you uh, find the love for the game when you fall out of love with it? Uh, Terrence. Yeah, for me, I mean, I think we, we talked about this a little is um, choosing different games, I think is a really big thing, right? If you've been a specialist in, you know, probably 90% of people who listen to this thing play almost exclusively no limit hold them, or maybe they play a little bit of PLO, but learning the other games definitely has helped me a bunch. I mean, I was a limit hold them specialist for so long. Uh, and you know, I, I, I grew up playing limit hold them and then I was actually like a no limit sit and go specialist for a while. And I burned out on that and I went back to limit hold them. And then I, I ascended those ranks so quickly that it became unprofitable for me to play anything else. Cause my time playing limit hold them was, was worth so much. But, but I burned out. Um, and to the point where I quit playing poker professionally, I, I got a job. I took a job offer from somebody at a startup uh, just because just it was something different to do. Um, and then I quit that. And yeah, I mean, th- that's, that's what I do mostly. You know, I think, you know, I, I, I study a little no limit now. I've got a kid. So I, again, like I don't spend a lot of time in poker, but, but playing the short deck, you know, I still... I still enjoy playing like the eight game mix. If I can play it with friends, one of the things I wanted to do was, was try to get like a, like a, a group of friends to play like eight game mix with for, for not so big stakes um, because most of my friends are better than me. Um, but that's one of the things I wanted to do. I, I, so I think for me playing the other games was, was super helpful and, you know, and, and that will reinvigorate your, your sort of love. Uh, I think. Daniel. Yeah, so for me throughout my career, one of the, because it obviously happens, and it happened a lot more than me when I was younger, because I was playing tournaments like 300 something days a year, right? Uh, when I was back in like the late 90s and early 2000s. So one of the things uh, I found really worthwhile is like, you know, Tyrant said, Terrence, Terrence said, playing other games. So like while I was waiting for my 2040 limit holding seat, I'd go play like 1020 stud. So always learning a, a new game or something like that. Like these days, you know, now that I'm a little bit older, maybe, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll learn how to, I'll take a challenge to play heads up, no limit, like a format I know very little about and say, fuck it, let's just play 200, 400. And, uh, you know, that'll be fun. And that'll reignite uh, my passion maybe to learn how to play poker. But I think taking a little bit of time off is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And often you'll find that if, you know, poker is a game that you love, you will reignite that passion on its own. 
And one of the other ways to do that, as, as Terrence mentioned, is try different variations, try different games, even wild card games, like whatever. Anything that makes your brain think outside of autopilot, uh, where you got to think about new things like, whoa, this is weird. So I'm playing short deck and I have ace king against jack 10, but like I'm not in that good of shape, right? So just thinking about things in a different way is always a lot of fun. Next one. All right. Well, my, oh, my, my answer, by the way, would be, uh, you know, global pandemic really reinvigorates your love for the bay, for the game. For the online game. Yeah, for the online game. Email number two, two, one. Hey, guys. Robert from Portland here. Really enjoy the show. Thank you. Uh, just a couple quick questions. Uh, first of all, with the World Series going online, I'm wondering when they get down to a final table or three or four guys, is there any mechanism for those guys to pause the action and work out a chop? Um, especially in some of the bigger events, that could be pretty significant money. I'm uh, just wondering if there's any way to do that. Secondly, for Daniel, uh, wondering if you have ever played John Robert um, on the pool table. Have you gambled with him at all? I know he likes to gamble a pool uh, or any other pool player or poker player for that matter. Uh, if you have any uh, pool stories. Uh, again, thank you for the show. Look forward to hearing from you. Bye. Thanks, Robert. Uh, what was the first question was, was he talking about online or live uh, tournament? Uh, he was talking about the online, and I, I will just tell him that GG Poker, when you play and you make final tables or whatever, it's a really cool feature that pops up in the top right corner, and it says deal, and it's a green flag, okay? So if you are open to making a deal, you click on the green flag, okay? So if you click on the green flag, everyone sees that you're, you're open to a deal. If everyone else that's left clicks on the green flag, now you open the floor to have a deal, eternally pause until you actually, you know, come to terms on a deal. So absolutely within the software. And it also gives you a little insight. Well, I mean, it would anyway, but like, you know, if you're five hand and you see one, one guy say deal, you know, he might be a little scared, you know, it can cause you a little psychological advantage, but yeah, there's definitely that in, within the software. As far as pool goes, I have played JRB once. Played it like we were at a party or something like that on a really shitty table, goofing around. Um, and I'm nowhere near as – I'm pretty bad right now. And he's probably – was always better than me at the eight ball, nine ball format. Um, but as far as like with a lot of the poker players, they don't have a lot of good pool stories. My pool stories come from way back when, like when I was a teenager. And I played this one guy named Jason French. And I know Joe – we just, you know how you talk about the martingale? We played, we back then, we played for like two or five bucks in a beef patty. Because Jamaican patties were a big thing with cocoa butter, cocoa bread. So we played like two dollars in table. So I played him for two bucks. I beat him. I was like, all right, let's play for four. It's like, all right, play for four. So now I'm up. And, I, and now he's like, all right, well, let's play for eight. Beat him again. No joke. This day went on. I started with two dollars. We're at plus 3,200 <laughs> scale of like the max. And he's like, one more for 3,200. Let's just double or nothing. I'm like, bro, we're fucking 17. Like, I don't think you have $6,400. I don't think you have 3,200, first of all. Um, and so I declined the last match, but I beat him for 3,200. He didn't have the money, but I had a friend named Randall. Okay. Randall was six, five, six, four about 400 pounds, big, scary dude. He was your um, grandma. He was grandma from Rounders. I know. He was a big dude, Randall. He was a friend of my brother's. So I never got the 3,200, obviously, because he didn't have it. But I think I got 800, some of which went to Randall, which was totally fine. <laughs> but yeah, can you 800 imagine? more than you would have got without Randall. Like, where would you have stopped? When you're 17, like, I'm curious, where would you have stopped and said, I don't know, man. Like, I had a big edge. Like, I wasn't going to lose the guy, most likely, with playing snooker. But, uh, okay, two bucks, four bucks, eight bucks. Like, let's say your bankroll at the time was like 150 bucks. That's what you go. Let's say 200. Your bankroll is 200 bucks, right? And now you're up X amount of dollars. Like, when do you say to the guys, like, and you're not sure if you're going to get paid. When do you say, I don't know if I can do this. Unless yeah, that's, the, that's the, the key thing. I mean, because if, if, you're, if you're sure you're going to get paid is, the answer, is a very different answer. You just, you just keep playing until it's, until it's like seven figures and you can't handle it anymore. But if you're not sure you're going to get paid, the, the correct answer is, you stop when you think you might get paid, uh, which which it might be like a, a zero game, right? Like if you stop at sixty four dollars, maybe he would have just said like, "No, fuck you, I'm not." Paying but like you have a two hundred dollar bankroll, right? So you got to think in terms of like, all right, I got two hundred bucks. 
Okay. But you know what? On the off chance, maybe he could pay me 3000 That's pretty fucking good, right? <laughs> yeah. And if I feel like I'm 85% to win the match, eh, we'll go one more time, two more well, times. Well, it, it's, it's an interesting thing, right? Because the higher the number gets, the lower the probability of getting paid is, right? So, if, you know, maybe you've got a 60% chance of getting paid $64 and a 45% chance of getting paid 128 and a 30% chance of getting paid $256. Like you kind of just got to, even though this is what we do in poker, right? We kind of make these calculations on the fly and think like, where's, where's the EV point at the highest? Where's the, what's the highest number I think I can actually get away with with a reasonable chance that if I don't, well, I go I, above I did this pretty number. Good. Yeah. I did pretty good getting 800, right? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's pretty good. I, I got agree. 800 bucks. I gave 160 to Randall. So I made $640. And if I would have stopped when I really thought, you know, it was like, okay, it's getting ridiculous, dude. I'm not playing you. We started a $2 game. We're not playing 500 bucks. I'm like, ah, fuck it. I'm going to beat him anyway. But that's like, that's a degen gambler mentality. Like that doesn't happen. I remember Barry Green stuff. Okay. No joke. When we were playing heads up at the win. Okay. We we're playing matches for 500,000 bucks, heads up four and 8,000. Okay. He beats me the first stud match. And I'm like, all right, let's, you know, we'll just play stud again. I was like, do you want to just give me 500 and I'll go to my box later? I'm obviously good for it. He said, no. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. He wanted me to go to my box and get the money. Right. I was like, okay, bro, it's fine. You know, whatever. But yeah, I mean, I've definitely been in spots where like I loaned a guy a hundred thousand in a game or more. I'm like, fuck, I hope I get some of that back. (laughs) I also made one big mistake many years ago. John Horn, which is Mike Tyson's manager, okay? Yeah, I, he used to play at Hollywood Park. I remember him. So he was playing with us two and 400, right? And I'm in the game. This is way back when. Todd Brunson's in the game. A bunch of people are in the game. And I'm like, I'm not doing that good in the game. I've got like 13K in front of me, whatever. I have more, but, you know. Uh, John Horn, you know, he's in the game and he's our, he's our sucker, right? So he goes broke and he looks at me and he's like, I don't even know the guy that well. He's like, can I get five? 5,000, right? And I made a rookie mistake then. I was new to the environment. And I looked over at Todd, and Todd had like fucking 60,000 in front of him. I'm like, well, I don't only have 13 on just Todd. <laughs> right? So Todd, now I put him on the fucking spot, right? So now Todd throws the guy to 5,000. Obviously, John is like never going to, he never pays. And I don't have much money at this time. I don't have 20,000 in my name, probably, like right around that neighborhood. But Todd is pissed, rightfully so, because I put him on the spot, and you're not supposed to do that. It's just like bad etiquette when you're a pro. So I paid Todd the 5,000, right? Wow. Wow. And I gave him the 5,000 because it felt like the right thing to do. And John Horn has never paid since. And, you know, I'm out the 5,000, but it feels right. Like I learned that lesson, you know? Like, listen, I, don't, I didn't have to pay Todd, but he's, he makes a good point. Listen, if I don't want to loan the guy money, just say, no, man, I don't have enough. Don't go, oh, look at Adam. Adam's got a lot of money. Or ask Terrence. Don't do that because then I put somebody else in spot. If he wants to ask you, Terrence, or Ter- let him do that. But don't push him that way because then you put the guy in an awkward position. So I was a kid. I learned my lesson. And uh, five, five k down the drain. So you're, you're playing in a game where you had 50 bets to your name. Oh, buddy, I played in games when I had eight bets to my name. <laughs> Six bets. Come on. You talk about only having seven big bets in limit hold them. I'm like, I was, it was a luxury having more than five in the games that I was playing in back then. Terrence is a super nit. He's always overall. Only have hard. seven big fucking bets, which is like, I, I've gone broke, but it's, it. it's the way I used to stretch in limit hold them, like seven big bets. So I could see three flops, theoretically. <laughs> That's not, you can't, you can't miss for three yeah. flops. Three flops are going to hit something. Yeah. I'm not the kind of guy who folds once he sees a flop, though. Well, listen, yeah. you, you know, yeah, you'd see one blind, you, whatever, you, you finagle. <laughs> All right, one more Roscoe. Let's do one. All right. Email number three. Hey guys, this is uh, Leo in Raleigh, North Carolina. Love your podcast. Wanted to talk to you about um, drinking and online poker. I wanted to hear if you guys have any good stories about alcohol and playing online. I know when I play online poker, I like to have a few drinks. I feel like it loosens me up. To the appropriate amount, uh, I'm probably a little bit too tight normally, so um, adding a few drinks makes me probably three bet where I should be instead of uh, feeling like I always need to call in position and play too tight, and I want to hear how do you guys handle that. <laughs> Give me some good stories. 
I uh, I know Terrence has a whole bunch of drinking while playing poker stories. Let's start with Terrence. You got to have tons of those. So many. No, <laughs> I've, I've I don't drink. What I don't I don't really even drink anymore. So I, I don't drink no, when I play online no. poker. Um, I, I I mean I've, I've heard there's there's probably if you're talking about performance enhancing drugs, which is kind of the theme of this question, I think there are probably like better drugs to increase your online poker performance. Um, All right. So I want to answer this question, but forget online. Just just poker in general, right? Because this really brings me back. Mike Lang. A lot of you guys don't remember oh, Mike. Oh, I know Mike, yeah. Okay, so Mike Lang, he was a drinker, drank whiskey. And uh, when he was totally sober, he was, you just bluffed his ass. He was just super tight, nitty, you know. When he had a few drinks in him, you know, he was tough. Played pretty fucking tough. And he had, like, too many drinks and, you know, didn't matter anymore. But he, it reminded me of Bill Smith. Because Doyle Brunson used to talk about Bill Smith. who won, I think, the 1985 World Series of Poker. He was an alcoholic. But Bill Smith, he said... When he was sober, he was the tightest player in the world. Weak, easy, right? When he was drunk, he was the worst player in the world. But when he was just a little drunk, he was unbeatable, right? So I'm not suggesting alcohol as a, you know, drug to enhance your poker, but there is something to be said about a little bit of alcohol loosening your inhibitions to feel free to make a play that you feel is right in the moment or whatever the case may be and you have the balls to do it without overthinking it, right? The problem is, how do you stay within that realm, you know, and not go overboard and drink too much where now you're just playing nine, six offsuit for four bets. Cause Tip the waitress really good to, pay, to give you only one drink per level, I guess. Look, I remember being drunk playing two, I was playing 200, 400 against Jimmy Grove and it was an Omaha eight or better hand. And I literally made this fucking play. The board was, Eight eight eight, queen three. Okay, eight eight eight, queen three. There's no low, right? Just Omaha height or better. I put in five bets on the river. I didn't have an eight. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just kept convincing myself that, like, wow, if he doesn't have an eight, he's got a fold. <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't have an eight, man, this play is gonna really work. He's not like a phone. So when you drink, your brain, your brain plays tricks on you, you know? So you got to be careful with it. Um, they, uh, I played in uh, the very first – I used to play fairly regularly in the very first pot limit hold'em game, which was at Hollywood Park in like 97, 98. First start, there was no no limit hold'em. It was all limit, limit games. Um, and there was a guy, and his name was Scotty. And he was a tall guy. He played in the game every day, and he drank, and he drank, and he drank. And he was the best player in the game by far. <clears throat> and he got better as he got as he had more drinks. And Scotty, where was Scotty? <laughs> yeah, Hollywood Park. It wasn't. Oh my Scotty. God, I know him. Yeah, Love this guy. yeah. He he would he as soon as he had seven drinks in him, he would just destroy everybody. He was amazing at it. You, Scotty, you know the guy? Scotty win too. I know Scotty. I used to play. I used to grind with Scotty, and I used to sit next to Scotty, and I learned so much from Scotty. Yeah. Paul him at Holden. We used to play back in the day with him. And he would just like super aggro but you're right you know it was always related to alcohol when the more he drank the more ball the just balls of steel you know yeah he was the best for sure uh all right that's gonna wrap it up thanks so much uh to everybody for getting together tonight and thanks to you guys out there for watching uh or listening through the podcast app uh you know obviously some some events to fire at out there if you're going to uh, jump in to uh, gg poker and play for some bracelets help us win our overlay bet yeah, we need the overlay bet to come through. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, Daniel, uh, run run good and won some money for in the bracelet bets. Let's go. Yeah, good news is nobody else has won a bracelet. They've come yeah. close. But still plenty good. of time, you know. I'll be streaming uh, by the time this is out. You might not see it, but whatever. But I'll be streaming on Twitch as well, but I'll be streaming on the ggpoker.tv. I'm also on youtube.com slash dnubranu. Check that out. We get crazy. Have some fun. No alcohol, though. There we go. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Go Canucks.